Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Dave Perrin, and I have the distinct honor and pleasure to be moderating this historic session uh, for the Rocky Mountain Athletic Trainers Association on the evolution of athletic training education and roots of a profession. We have a very, very distinguished set of speakers up here. Uh, I think uh, all of them are very familiar to you. Lindsay McLean, John Schrader, Gary Delforge, and Bob Benke. I've taken the liberty of lifting their bios from the Hall of Fame website. <laughs> Lindsay McLean was chair of the certification committee from 1969 to 1979. Lindsay McLean began his career as a student in 1956 at Vanderbilt. By 1963, he was head athletic trainer and director of physical therapy at the University of California. He was head athletic trainer for the San Francisco 49ers from 1979 to 2003. McLean's legacy is the certification exam and requirements, which he helped establish. He is retired and living in Tennessee. John Trader was chair of the Professional Education Committee from 1980 to 1982. John Schrader rose through the ranks into administration at Indiana University. He served on the NATA board and was co-chair of the Education Task Force that was instrumental in education reform. He was IU's graduate athletic training program director, coordinator of the athletic training education program, associate chair of the kinesiology department, and assistant dean for student academic affairs in the School of Public Health. He is now retired and living in Arizona. Gary Del Forge was chair of the Professional Education Committee from 1981 until 1987. Gary Del Forge is a premier educator, founding the graduate program at what would become the Arizona School of Health Sciences after developing one of the first NATA-approved graduate curricula at the University of Arizona, where he spent the bulk of his career. Del Forge was a member of the NATA Professional Education Committee for over 17 years. He also served on the board, keeping education at the center of his focus. He is now retired and living in Arizona. Robert S. Bob Benke was chair of the Professional Education Committee from 1987 to 1998 and chair of the Joint Review Committee on Educational Programs and Athletic Training from 1990 to 1998. Bob Benke has held numerous teaching and athletic training positions throughout Indiana and Illinois. His extensive list of honors includes the NATA Educator of the Year in 1987, NATA Service Award in 1989, and NATA Hall of Fame in 1990. Benke's career in athletic training has taken him from an assistant student athletic trainer position at the University of Illinois to head athletic trainer and professor at Indiana State University. He is retired and living in Indiana. So that's our lineup. Our goals for the session will be to chronicle the history and evolution of education in the athletic training profession through a very delimited window of time. I want to make that clear. There's a lot that's gone on beyond where we're going to end, but we're going to focus on a specific period of time. In that context, we'll discuss the uh, contribution to the professionalization of athletic training. Primary focus will be on the creation of the certification committee and the role of the professional education committee and joint review committee on educational programs and athletic training. And again, the timeline will be through formation of the education council, and that's where we will end. You have access to a primary reading list that uh, several, everyone here has contributed to in one way or another. It's on the uh, meeting uh, conference app, and I think we also have 40 or 50 hard copies uh, in the back in the event that uh, you're, you're not an app user or you'd like to have a, have a hard copy. We'll be covering a number of landmark decisions. You'll hear from Lindsay McLean about the role that Pinky Newell played and getting this all started with the NATA Committee on Gaining Recognition in 1955. You'll hear about establishment of the first athletic training 
uh, educational programs, creation of the Professional Education Committee and the Certification Committee, 1969, approval of the first undergraduate program, administration of the first certification examination in 1970. You learn about approval of the first graduate athletic training education program in 1972 and the role that the Professional Education Committee played in creation of the competencies in athletic training in 1983. The resolution in 1980 requiring establishment of the athletic training curriculum major or equivalent by 1986. Recognition of the athletic training profession as an allied health profession by the AMA in 1990. Formation of the Joint Review Committee on Educational Programs in Athletic Training in 1990. We'll talk a little bit about approval of the essentials and guidelines for an accredited educational program for the athletic trainer by the AMA Council on Medical Education. Terms you'll learn about CAHIA and KHEP and the role that these organizations played in accreditation of our educational programs. Appointment of the Education Task Force in 1994 and then formation of the Education Council in 1996. That will be our endpoint. Now, the format we're going to follow is that I'm going to conclude my introductory comments very shortly, and then each speaker will talk for about uh, 30, 35 minutes, and our goal is to have a period of discussion following each presentation. And then we will have a period of discussion at the conclusion of all presentations before we uh, finish. We have some athletic training students who have uh, cards. If you would like to have a question uh, asked, uh, please just raise your hand and one of these uh, students will bring a card for you to fill out and they'll bring it up to me and we'll get it integrated into the, uh, into the discussion. A few acknowledgments. Uh, you guys can't see that picture. Um, everyone on this list has contributed to the uh, creation of today's session, and I particularly want to acknowledge Mike Nesbitt, your former district director, who really played a critical role in pulling this all together, planted the seed, got us started. Mike Nesbitt, of course, has a, uh, a very special passion and energy uh, for our profession. And so, Mike, thank you for all you've done for the profession and for all you did to pull this session together. So, we'll get started with Mr. Lindsay McClain. Prevention and injury class when I was a collegiate athletic trainer, so maybe that qualifies me a little bit to be on this distinguished panel. How did certification begin? How did formal education for athletic trainers begin? Well, it certainly didn't start with me. It started, I feel, with Pinky Noel. And let me see if I can find Pinky's. There you go. This side. I don't know the date this photograph was taken, but it was early in Pinky Noel's career at Purdue. He's got his letter jacket on. He's the guy on the left. The guy in the middle is Stu Holcomb, their football coach, and the guy on the right with the MD on his Purdue letter jacket is Dr. Sayers Miller. Uh, that name will be familiar to you later on, I'm sure, in this talk, because his son, Sayers Bud Miller, uh, the second, was one of Pinky Knoll's first student trainers at Purdue. You'll surely learn more about Bud later. Bud's son, Sayers John Miller III, is currently on the faculty at, at Penn State University, where his dad chaired the uh, athletic training cur curriculum. Before that, he was the first 
assistant I hired when I was named head athletic trainer with the San Francisco 49ers. So I do have a bit of connection with the Bud Miller, uh, the first, second, and third family. My mentor at Vanderbilt was Joe Warden. Pinky was known by everybody because he was the executive director of the NATA at the time, and I needed a job after I got out of PT school. So Joe called Pinky to see what was out there. That's the way we did it then. You don't have all these committees you go through. And Michigan needed an assistant. And he helped me find that job as an assistant at University of Michigan in 1961. And obviously I took the job. Fast forward seven years. I was the head athletic trainer at San Jose State, and I was just a young guy trying to be a professional and trying to do what I could uh, every day as an athletic trainer. In 1967, when the Arizona State Sun Devils came to town, something happened. I had heard in the offseason that Art Dickinson Jr. had resigned and moved to an exercise physiology uh, faculty position at the University of Colorado. Art Dickinson Jr. was one of the finest athletic trainers we had in, in that era. In fact, he was the first editor of the NATA Journal. I'd heard one of the reasons he left is because the new head football coach, can I mention his name, Troy? Frank Cush. <laughs> had wanted to exert more control of the athletic training room, including who could play and who could not play if they had injuries. That rumor did not sit real well with me because I thought our job was to make those kind of decisions. Anyway, as I usually did, I went over on Friday afternoon to the visiting team locker room to, to meet the new guy and to offer any help that I could regarding preparation for the game the next day. We had a nice conversation and he seemed like to me a very good guy. He told me he had been a long-term friend of Frank's and he was a junior high school principal from Indiana and when Frank offered him the job he thought about it and said, I've got asthma and this dry climate would be wonderful for me, so he took it. Then he said, I'm really glad you came over. Can you lend me some tape? This was my first road trip and I forgot to pack any. <laughs> of course I loaned it to him, but this really bothered me. What was my chosen profession becoming? How could anybody go on the road and not take tape? Honestly, I don't remember his name, but I do know he preceded Troy at Arizona State. After practice, for some reason, I went immediately back to my office and started typing a letter to Pinky. We had a relationship. Pinky thought I was one of his guys since he first got me the job, so I thought I could, uh, I could write him uh, and communicate with him better than a lot of people could. By 11 o'clock that night, I finished the letter and entitled it, Does the NATA Need a Certification Exam? And put it in the mail. A few days later, Binky called me and asked my permission to put it in the NATA journal. I was in transition at that time from San Jose State to the University of Michigan. Certainly I agreed, and I thought that was the end of it. Unfortunately for me, <laughs> however, Pinky called me a few uh, months later and said he was establishing a professional advancement committee, and he asked me to serve on the committee. I agreed thinking I wouldn't have much to do, but I agreed. He said he was appointing 
call me later. Call me later, and and this is what stunned me. He said, I am going to appoint Bud Miller as chair of the professional education committee. I'm going to appoint you as chair of the certification committee. And I didn't know a darn thing about how to make a certification committee work. But Pinky said, it doesn't matter. You want to see it happen. It's hard. It's always. It was always hard for me to say no to Pinky. So, with a lot of help from Pinky, I went to work. This is the first certification committee. Wait a minute. I backed up. Well, I guess I got them out of order. But this is the first certification committee that we had. I tried to be geographically diverse and get athletic trainers from all parts of our profession. Back in those days, there were only one or two female athletic trainers. We only had athletic trainers in the collegiate, professional, and high school areas. So that's why this reflects that. Uh, Joe Altod from Columbia University, uh, I met on a shuttle bus going from the convention in Cincinnati back to the airport. I said, man, he, he seemed like a nice guy, and he's from the East Coast. Why don't I name him? So uh, that was good. James Dodson from Midland, Texas, uh, was our high school representative. Chris Patrick from University of Kentucky, uh, I knew very well, and I was very comfortable with him on the committee. Uh, George Sullivan, everybody knew George. Unfortunately, if you read the latest issue of the NATA News, his obituary is in the back. Uh, he just passed away a few months ago. Link Kamura, uh, he, I knew it from being at San Jose State, he was at San Francisco 49ers. Then I knew Dr. James Furick from Michigan State, who was very interested in, in sports medicine, and Fred Bailing. He was a team physician for Stanford, who I had known when I was at San Jose State. Then we came up with a procedures for certification at that time. Pinky had a lot to do with this. In fact, he sent this to me in the mail or something similar. He said, what do you think? So I said, that looks pretty good. So we got sections there. Remember, we did not have athletic training educational commission, uh, committees at that time or curriculums. So we had to figure a way to certify what we had. And the first section was for people who had not been grandfathered in, who were working in a profession, but not yet certified. Weren't very many of those, because we grandfathered most everybody in, so that there would be no issues of anxiety about having to take an exam for somebody who had been an athletic trainer for 30 years and hadn't seen a textbook in uh, at least that amount of time. <laughs> then we had graduates of an NATA approved curriculum, which at that point, there weren't any. <laughs> Section three was the physical therapy degree graduate who had to work for 800 hours for two years under a certified athletic trainer. And section four, was the apprenticeship route, which at that time, most everybody uh, became certified through. Uh, all they had to do is work 1,800 hours directly under a certified athletic trainer, and then they'd be qualified upon college graduation to take the exam. This is some of the uh, terrible slides, but I'm going to put this down because I think I can remember what I was going to say. Uh, this is one of the proposals we had to develop an exam. Uh, Pinky knew the people at the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine, Casey Clark in Chicago. He said, why don't we let them do us an exam? Uh, and we went and visited with them, and they said for about $30,000 we can come up with something. And then we heard about the Professional Examination Service in New York. They had a much more reasonable exam 
proposal, $7,000, they said. We can prepare a written exam for you, and we uh, could use some of their banked questions that they used with other uh, medical-related organizations like OT and uh, nurses. So questions that pertain to basic uh, anatomy, physiology, and pathology, which we needed to know also we could use for free basically from them. So we only had to develop uh, a number of questions for ourselves. And that turned out to be uh, the most reasonable way to do it. So we started meeting with the Professional Examination Service in New York, and this was our first meeting. Uh, at the top is, uh, from the left is George Sullivan. Uh, the next person is Dr. Furyk from Michigan State. We wanted to have a team doctor there with us to develop exams so everybody would think we were trying to be professional about it. Uh, then we had Bud Miller. He was the next guy over. Uh, we wanted a, a person from the Professional Education Committee there at the time the exam was developed so that we could be sure to keep them happy. And then Joe Altot, uh, on the far right, he was just down the road at Columbia University, so he was an inexpensive guy to bring in for help with the exam. In, in the front row, I've got Chris Patrick on my left. That's me in the middle, and uh, Ruth Shaper from the Professional Examination Service. You can see the sequence of events uh, that we had as we developed the exam. In February of 1970, I asked Link uh again, he's, he was on the committee from the San Francisco 49ers, to start working on uh, developing an oral practical exam, come up with some questions. Uh, we, we wanted to make sure an athletic trainer knew how to tape an ankle. We wanted to make sure he could evaluate an injury, and we wanted to make sure that uh, they uh, – new first aid. So our questions for oral practical exams revolved around that. And in order to take the exam, of course, we required that you be certified in CPR. So then we moved on to uh, developing the written exam. And we gave the first exam in uh, District 6 at their meeting in Waco, Texas, I believe, in uh, uh, August of 1970. First time we gave the exam at the National Convention was the next year in Baltimore uh, with about 45 candidates, of which one was a female. Uh, and interesting enough, it was one of Pinky's students. A few years later, we had a meeting sponsored by the uh, Johnson & Johnson Company to help develop a plan to get more athletic trainers into the high school level. So in 1974, in Williamstown, Massachusetts, I don't pronounce Massachusetts very well, uh, we met. And this is Pinky. He's a proud Pinky with his... Uh, professional Advancement Committee. He's got Bud Miller on my left, me and my toupee uh, right there, and on our right is uh, Mel Blickenstaff. And Mel had been a high school athletic trainer in Indiana, and he had just gone to Indiana State, and he developed the first uh, NATA educational curriculum. And Mel told me there, he said, you know, I thought this was a great idea, but what I've done now is created a monstrosity. And and I, I didn't know quite what he meant until a few, le few years later, uh, my own mon monstrosity developed with certification. We grew awful fast. I had a secretary uh, from the football office that was working part-time to help me process uh, applications and correspondence for the certification exam and then she couldn't do enough for me so I had to go out and find 
a secretary in, in Ann Arbor. And uh, so between me and her, uh, as the thing grew, it became overwhelming to me, and it became my monstrosity, uh, but, which is good because we needed it. Uh, communication with education. This is one of the ways we communicate. This was a, uh, a memo pad that I had made up with had carbon copies I'd keep, and he'd keep, and he'd return one. Uh, but this is to Bud Miller in 1975 about something I don't even know. But Bud uh, replied and, and said, you know, uh, we'll discuss this with the Education Committee. So we tried to work hand in hand with the Education Committee to uh, develop our exam and make sure uh, we were all on the same page. I'm going to show Dan L Lepra. Uh, because he was a very important person in the development of the certification. In fact, when I gave up athletic, uh, when I gave up the committee in 1979, uh, Paul Grace uh, at MIT took it over. Paul did not have much work to do there, so he had plenty of time, <laughs> and, and he had uh, a lot of good ideas. And he he took what I started and really developed it in a good way. Uh, things got pretty complicated back then. Uh, we developed a, uh, a continuing education program, which I didn't have, but Paul did. And uh, he actually moved all of the uh, administrative things to the national office in Greenville, North Carolina. Uh, so he didn't have to deal with secretaries in, in Boston. I don't know why I didn't think of that. but. Volunteers over the years have done an awful lot. Uh, they helped me right from the start. People wrote questions. People uh, set up uh, local oral practical exams. Uh, they monitored it. Uh, we couldn't have done it without a ton of volunteers, and Dan Le Libra was one of the best. In fact, they have an award now that they give to uh, the Volunteer of the Year uh, from the Board of Certification. That's the highest award that they give to anybody. I'm sure most of you know that he passed away uh, from ALS uh, in, in the late 90s, I believe. But uh, you can be proud of the fact that a District 7 guy was so highly regarded by the certification uh, board that uh, they would name such an award after him. This is a Christmas card that I received uh, from the Board of Certification uh, two years ago. And at the bottom is the actual Board of Certification. It's a bunch of uh, athletic trainers who've been elected, uh, public people, doctors, uh, and the like, have nothing to do with administering exam. They just make the policy. At the top is the administrative staff in Omaha, Nebraska. There's 19 people in that picture. They're all full-time employees. And things have certainly changed a little bit since 1970 when I was the only uh, employee and I had a secretary to help me. So it it's, uh, it's, was really a great honor to try to develop this exam. I'm glad that somebody else took it over and and made it what it is today. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we'll move on. Uh, John Trader, please. day with our original logo, <clears throat> it was, uh, I, I believe, probably serendipity that I ended up being in the position that I was in through the connection of Pinky and uh, Sarah's Bud Miller. Uh, so I was a short timer, 
with on, on the board of uh, uh, professional education and then circled back around uh, later in my career to become involved. So, so while my stay was short, I hope to kind of give you the context and some of the challenges that occurred uh, during that period of time uh, when I was associated with the boards. And to give you a little bit about technology, <laughs> now I want to let you know that I was the uh, proud owner of several pairs of these pants and also those shoes, except I had some blue and red crepe shoes that were in that model at that point in time. The interesting thing about fashion at that point, the NBA banned wearing those shoes during that era because they had an epidemic of Achilles tendonitis with the NBA players. <laughs> so technology and what we were working with at that point in time. Those of you who may recognize this are starting to get old. Those of you that don't recognize this are pretty young. A really hot item at that point in time was an IBM Selectric typewriter. So uh, being able to generate documents at that point in time was a bit of a challenge because everything had to be handwritten, hand corrected. Um, the item on the left is a, is a correction tape that, that suddenly uh, became part of that uh, Selectric typewriter and word processing was totally unheard of. I uh, finished my uh, master's thesis in 1975. The chair of my thesis committee was the editor of Biomechanics Journal at that time, and um, she was notorious for marking up my paper. So after 13 typewritten versions, of course, the pagination all gets messed up if you have to edit it. She wants this paragraph moved here. So after 13 times, I told her, no, I wasn't doing it again. And that's when she finally decided to say, okay, it's approved. <laughs> Any type of computer, computer technology was non-existent, uh, so we were doing everything by paper pencil, and this was, this was the berries when we finally got this mobile phone that you could use for on-site emergency calls, and the batteries in those weighed about 10 pounds uh, that you had to lug around. And the point I'm trying to make is it was much more of a challenge in that era to put documents together, to send them to committee members, to send those materials to the board of directors, where now we don't even think about it with a few keystrokes, we're distributing it to hundreds of people all in that same keystroke. And so this was our life, lots of paper. Uh, Bud Miller was notorious, everybody talked about Bud's uh, notorious recliner that in his home, that was the PEC office. So his recliner uh, was surrounded by stacks of paper all the way around that he had his files for the different curricula and the different projects that we were working on at that particular time. <coughs> the early members of the organization, and I'm going to go through these particular ones uh, relatively quickly, but I want to point out some uh, some things with this <coughs> as we move along. Uh, so th this represents the group of individuals that were involved early on with professional education. Uh, <coughs> Gerald Bell was at Cal State and he was finishing his education uh, doctorate. And he was uh, involved on the committee with a, a, a investigating uh, accreditation and the potential for accreditation. Paul Zeke was uh, in charge of the undergraduate programs. Ron Sendry was, uh, would review all the annual reports at that point in time. Uh, Jack Redman was charged with continuing education, uh, that, which was part of professional education at that point in time. So when Pinky had given the charge, if it was education, it was in our committee. And <clears throat> at that point in time, there was uh, a substantial amount of things that we were endeavoring to become involved with. 
Joanne Dosomacio from Brown University was doing curriculum graduate studies, so she was following uh, where our graduates were going and what kind of positions they were uh, involved in. Phil Donnelly at Westchester, he was doing, he was involved with doing experiment, the, we were entertaining opportunities for experimental programs and the emphasis here was on high schools and infusing more athletic trainers into the high school system because that was the broadest population of people we felt like we could make an impact on with our athletic training services. Again, Gary with graduate education and I was tasked with professional preparation conferences uh, after that was Phil Donnelly started the first one and then I became involved in doing the professional preparation conferences which was the probably the very first educators conference that we had in the profession. The focus of those particular meetings was really uh, skewed towards the uh, academic uh, faculty at institutions. Leon Ski at Orange Coast College was doing educational publications. We had no external media people. So if you wanted to do proceedings of a meeting, you had a tape recorder, you had a transcriber, and you had to format that on paper, and then you had to go take it to someplace and have it duplicated, bound, and then mail out those materials. Dan Seeley at uh, University of Washington were doing educational uh, displays, publications. Uh, Al Proctor was with the North, North Carolina State Department of Education and they had a sports medicine division and he was involved with experimental programs again because he was trying to get athletic trainers in all the high schools. Glenn Snow was doing uh, workshops at the annual meeting and then both Dave Knoppel here in the, in the uh, front row uh, was involved in doing uh, visit, uh, site visits, visitation team training and then ultimately uh, Dr. Lou Osternig <coughs> uh, again took over that um, his position. To DM, um, University of New Mexico, the standard bearer for ethics uh, he was uh, involved in et standards for uh, ethical standards for educators. Dan Foster was in charge of establishing a program director's council, so any lead in an academic program. And obviously, Bud Miller was chair. And Barbara Gates was at Penn State with uh, Bud, and she was full time PEC. So she was actually the only employee that was involved with the NATA, uh, paid by the NATA. Talk a little bit about the characteristics of professional uh, education council. And I think these are important because we, you could look at the kind of the challenges or the struggles as we evolved as a profession. There were four doctorally prepared athletic trainers on the professional education committee. One with a research doctorate, PhD. Uh, three with professional doctorates. Uh, we had five that came from a physical therapy background. 14 college athletic trainers in the group, one high school athletic trainer, and then the one State Department of Education representative, which was also focused on the high school. Challenges. Only two members of the entire committee were full-time educators. The rest of us were practicing clinicians and educators at the same time. Because in many cases, that's the only way you could have an academic program is you, the academic units would not hire full-time faculty to teach in a program that wasn't necessarily a distinctive degree pattern. So you would do your athletic training, you would teach your classes. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the other challenge that we had is our focus was education, but we had these different entry models into the profession. So while we were really trying to continue to raise the bar for curricular preparation of athletic trainers, we had an intern route to preparation as well. But our focus was only on this one segment of the athletic training population. And <clears throat> needless to say, that became challenging when you were trying to substantially make bigger strides in terms of that, that bar compared to uh, other routes. Workload was quite heavy. We had just the mechanical aspects of trying to communicate. 
uh, the paperwork that was there in addition to the fact that most of us were split appointment people. And uh, again, so I think Pinky told me at one point in time, if you're on a split appointment, both sides want 100% work. So it, it uh, very frequently doesn't necessarily turn out real well. We were self-directed for future planning. We just organized uh, as a committee, but relatively speaking, and as a consequence, the board had so many other issues, the, the NATA board of directors had so many issues that they were dealing with, we were basically kind of, okay, you set the agenda, you put out the plan, you tell us what you think is going to be best, and then we have the veto power on what your recommendations are. So, for example, I, at that point in time, I don't know if anybody could really uh, stand there and tell you this is a professional doctorate, this is a research doctorate, the lingo that is utilized, the academic rankings, the, all of those kinds of committee structures that occur in an academic unit that you don't see in an athletic environment. And we were all kind of emerging out of this athletic environment. And bottom line was we didn't know what we didn't know at that point in time. With the board of directors, they were all full-time clinical athletic trainers, one pro football athletic trainer, one junior college athletic trainer, and then 10 division one athletic trainers. Two of the 12 had any kind of curricular connection at that point to uh, understanding what professional education was to be about. So they truly operated from the administrative model. And when I, what I mean by that is uh, in athletics, it's I win, you lose. And, and so when you're talking about trying to, to address that uh, from an educational perspective, when you go in, it was, it was a, basically an all or none. It was not an, any kind of negotiated uh, consideration at that point in time. Also, there was role confusion. What I mean by role confusion is, and this, hap this still happens today uh, within the dynamics of, of organizations. You have a board of directors, you have an executive director. An executive director is a paid staff member. Your board of directors is the policy maker. The executive director works for the board of directors. In many organizations, it's flipped. In many organizations, the board feels like whatever the executive director tells us to do is what we're supposed to do, okay? And that becomes a challenge because the body of professional members are the ones that ultimately are the ones that should set policy and enact, have that policy enacted by the executive director. So this, <clears throat> this was a bit of a challenge for us as well. Um, between professional education, so we had communications issues because of the technology, uh, be between just our members to try and keep current on that. If you can envision the amount of time it would take to conduct business off of a hard line telephone to get all of these operations done, because that was the only basis of communication besides snail mail. So very time intensive from that standpoint as well as any time you wanted to send anything out in the mail, you had to wait a week before you could get information back <coughs> from, your, uh, from your committee at that point in time. We were just beginning to learn what the education language was, <coughs> and uh, because of our very backgrounds, there was a significant amount of discussion about what direction we were going. And that discussion was, was really trying to, to make an attempt to do what was best for the profession, thinking long-term at that point in time. Uh, education was considered a small part in the scope of the Board of Directors, and I distinctively remember this when I was to present to the Board of Directors, uh, and, and I think this sent a significant message, at least to me, being passionate about education. The, on the uh, order of the agenda for the Board of Directors meeting, we were item 62. Okay, so, so I felt like that was saying something in the process. So <clears throat> giving you the, the very 
kind of brief history uh, with a couple of important points uh, during the time that, that uh, I was involved in and became chair. The first professional preparation conference was held, and again, this was uh, focused towards educators. The idea behind those particular programs was curricular enhancement to give some, some cutting edge information related to pieces of, of education that could be put into a curriculum and uh, to give that information to those program or directors at that point in time. The, the actual, uh, the, the next actual stage, we were still at this point where we were trying to look at what we were going to do in terms of advancing the curriculum. And so uh, Bud Miller in, uh, in cooperation uh, at that point in time with uh, Al Proctor, Dr. Proctor, uh, hosted a professional, what was called the Quail Roost Conference in North Carolina. In this particular conference, um, this was our mission, uh, and that was basically to try to, pr to develop some uh, behavioral objectives for what would constitute a major within our profession. And uh, this was basically the first attempt. <coughs> uh, those are members of the, the committee uh, that were at that particular meeting. Uh, really pretty broad-based group. We spent lots of time uh, discussing what the future of athletic training and what the future of the profession looked like. Um, Bob and I were roommates and we spent hours upon hours after the meeting really talking about what was really going to be, what the education was going to look like uh, in the future <coughs> of the profession. So at that point in time, this was again <coughs> our first attempt at behavioral objectives it was a somewhat reverse engineered uh, attempt. And what I mean by that is our very first curricula were basically cherry picking courses out of departments that we felt like would make a good cluster of courses that we could call the athletic training major. And uh, literally very early on, uh, we had a lot of uh, sport uh, classes that were involved in the curriculum, thinking that, well, if you uh, are going to work with track athletes, if you take a coaching of track and field, then you're going to understand the mechanics and you're going to understand some of the physiology of preparation and training of those particular individuals. So <clears throat> when we established these behavioral objectives initially, they were developed by taking courses that were still there in the program and trying to pull out those specific behavioral objectives that seem to match what an athletic training practitioner would do. And again, most of those were from existing courses. I might also point out that why did, why did we start out where we did? We started out in schools of health, physical education, recreation. Well, I asked Pinky that question. And uh, Pinky sat back, took a sip of his cup of coffee, and he said, I went to every school in our university and I asked them if they would be interested in being the academic home for an athletic training program. And the only one that accepted us was health and physical education. And across the country, that's where most of them landed because no other school it was an identity issue. Nobody really knew what an athletic trainer was. And at the same point in time, the courses that we had clustered around always seemed to fit more or blend in more with the health and physical education curriculum. So in the summer of 89, the program uh, director's role in administering the certification exam uh, <coughs> became a bit of a controversy. So we established the exam. Educators were involved in helping to administer the exam, and I'm sure Lindsay probably had, had a volume of uh, correspondence related to this. But at, in 79, uh, the uh, Professional Education Committee agreed that program directors would not volunteer to 
be evaluators on the oral practical exam um, of the certification exam. And one of the reasons why this was controversial, it was basically saying that educators are less ethical than other clinical practitioners. Okay, so, so here they were involved in education, they gave, administered exams all the time, they were willing to volunteer to do this, but there was this sensitivity that, that we somehow seemed to be less ethical, and so uh, we, we uh, agreed not to have program directors involved in the exam. And then uh, in 79, mandatory continuing education was placed into effect, and once again, that was part of professional education committee. Uh, Jack Redburn's the volume of requirements continued to increase, and <clears throat> Jack was heavily involved in doing that at that point in time. Communication between the board of directors and the PEC was a challenge. Uh, so at that point in time, we tried to dis establish some sort of formal rules of conduct, so to speak, that uh, we would notify the board <coughs> of initial approvals and reapprovals at the mid-year meeting so they would, that they would be upcoming. And then the board of directors would notify the PEC if they had issues. And the reason why this occurred, uh, remember the athletic model that was operated by the board of directors, we would take uh, recommendations in to the board of directors and one director would maybe say to the other director, well, I heard that they're doing this at this particular institution. Remember, it's the athletic training mafia, so we had all the backdoor information. And, <clears throat> and so as a consequence, then we would have to try to defend what we had on paper that we had vetted through the committee, and then we were there trying to refute rumors. And so we tried to develop this somewhat code of conduct and procedural process so that we had, <coughs> had more effective communication at that point in time. 1979, there was a requirement that a t teaching certificate was required if you were an athletic trainer. We were still thinking high school athletic trainer model, uh, best place to be, and you know, it's the world of best intentions. High school athletic trainer, give them a teaching certificate, get them a job, and have them work two full-time jobs. <laughs> so, in uh, the fall of 79, <clears throat> these were basically the roles and responsibilities uh, of the athletic trainer. Investigate all possibilities of professional education advancement for the association and its members uh, in the athletic training profession and make those recommendations to the board. Confer with consultants regarding professional advancement, which means that we were the main contact for any academic institution. Recommend to the board the accreditation of schools offering graduate and undergraduate preparation. So uh, in <clears throat> in that particular context, we were making recommendations, but the board of directors was making the approval. So that's a far cry from where we are now. You know, that, that an academic, a group of academic experts make a decision whether an academic program has those merits, as opposed to then passing that on to essentially more of a group of professional practitioners to say yes or no on an academic uh, entity. Establish and supervise enforcement of professional standards uh, <clears throat> was also uh, a component to that. Cooperating with certification, which we did so very frequently, there was this interchange between uh, uh, certification and education because this was pre-role delineation. We were right on the cusp of doing the initial role delineation for athletic training. We were to recommend opportunities for in-service training, so that was continuing education. And again, I mentioned the, the consulting and liaison with academic institutions as well. So we had sub subcommittees. We were large enough that we had to have a subcommittee on graduate education. Uh, again, if you read that, recommended by the chair of PCC, appointed by the president with agreement of the executive director. So they were political appointments for academic expertise, uh, which was a <clears throat> somewhat of an interesting challenge. And likewise, the Subcommittee on Continuing Education. So April 3rd, 1980, uh, Bud Miller passes away. And uh, Bud was
was the driving force for this. He was a tireless worker. Uh, he had so many items on the agenda. We were really making great uh, steps forward, great strides forward in what we were doing from an educational perspective. Um, if you look at, and again, uh, thanks to uh, Rich Carey, who's on the Historical Commission, uh, for help with some of these pictures. He was a student athletic trainer. If you look closely at the uh, picture below, uh, <coughs> sporting that gray jacket is uh, former President Mark Smaha, uh, along with uh, Bud Miller and Rich Carey. This was actually at an uh, exhibit of athletic training education at an AMA meeting many, many years ago <coughs> in the uh, late 70s. So when Bud passed away, we had a number of items that were left undone, uh, and that's sort of where I came into the picture. Uh, <clears throat> we had to uh, finish the Quail Roos Conference proceedings, which was the first stage of trying to do some behavioral objectives. Uh, we approved our first four uh, curricula at that point in time. Mankato State, Indiana State, Lamar, and the University of New Mexico. And then in the winter of that of 1980, the, the first true major was at Central Michigan University. They established a 66-hour major. And um, this was on the heels of the Quail Roos Conference. And it was uh, a, a personal sidebar on this. We finished the Quail Roos Conference we're finishing writing up the, the uh, behavioral objectives. I have a visitor come to campus, which is a gentleman named Ron Sendry. And Ron and I stood at soccer practice. I'm covering IU uh, soccer at that point in time. We're standing at soccer practice on a five-tier bleacher system. So we're using the top bleacher as a desk, and, and we're writing what would constitute a good athletic training major, which he uh, he spent a week there with me, and then he went back to Central Michigan and really implemented that at that point in time. So the priorities, and I think this is probably one of the more important components of it, is these were all priorities in 1980, 1981 for professional education. We were desperate to have a full-time chair, and we were desperate to have that subsidized by the NATA because of the volume of work. We were establishing guidelines for a major. The whole issue about external accreditation uh, of our academic programs was a priority. We still had continuing education to address. We had to do the, the ongoing reviews of graduate and undergraduate programs. Uh, we were trying to work at really trying to decide what are we going to call a major in athletic training. Uh, that By that time, there were three majors, Central Michigan, Eastern Illinois, and Ohio. We were revising uh, the graduate guidelines. We were looking at uh, these experimental programs. Uh, a faculty athletic trainer program was in process in the Chicago area, as well as the one in North Carolina doing two professional education preparation conferences, East Coast, West Coast, uh, trying to establish some standards for the uh, site visitors because when you have a small cluster of individuals doing site visits, you can have pretty good continuity in terms of their, uh, their skills as evaluators. When you start enlarging that pool, you have the laws of the normal probability curve and you're going to have some that are eh, not so good that are going out and, and representing the, the profession. So we were trying to get some standardization. And then, interestingly enough, we were also looking at what's called a self-study now, but we, we called it the diagnostic exam, exam for educational programs uh, back in 1981. So the, uh, we had a joint meeting with certification in um, 1981, and this was at a point in time when we were working to centralize the national office. Very, very difficult to have your national office in one location, your committee operations.
operations in other locations. Uh, and at, at this point in time, my full-time secretary support was Barbara Gates at Penn State University. And the national office, I think, was uh, moving to Greenville at that point in time. And so the, the challenges of communication were fairly significant at this point. So my day started off with sitting at my desk, picking up the phone, calling Barb, verbally going through what the mail was for professional education on the phone without actually seeing it, and then, you know, stuffing things in an envelope and mailing back and forth. Um, <clears throat> And so in 1981, the PEC administrative assistance was moved from Penn State to the Greenville office. This summer of 1981, which was reported, um, the, well, it, another interesting item that occurred in 81 is the work environments started to expand and we moved into different venues besides the traditional high school, college. We were talking about what is the traditional setting because it was not becoming the traditional setting anymore. And there was also a, uh, a great challenge of what was actively engaged. Okay? And there was a, this, this huge uh, debate is that if you, if you worked with, moved in and worked in, with performing arts as we, we have today, well, you weren't actively engaged because you weren't working on athletes. Okay, because we had defined athletes so narrowly at that point in time. If you were an educator, were you really actively engaged? I mean, that was a, that was a challenge and that was a question that came up quite frequently. Uh, and, you know, obviously through lots of discussion, educators and active clinical practitioners were included as being actively engaged because you had to have your faculty to complement your, your clinical professionals uh, to prepare athletic trainers. So in, um, in the big picture, I sort of scratched out the Early Professional Education Committee and you can, you can see some of the origins of some of these other currently existing entities uh, that are out there uh, that really you can trace back some of the roots all the way back to the original professional education committee because we we originally were established to, to uh, from an education perspective to cover the world like sunshine if it had education in it we were involved in it at the early stage and as each thing grew significantly then they began to spin off into other organizations ironically uh, the Academic preparation, uh, so the, uh, the accreditation agency, the certification agency, and the NATA board uh, were administratively separated because of a lawsuit against the NATA. Uh, and they were separated uh, because of this lawsuit uh, because there was a question about someone being credentialed inappropriately. And uh, at that point in time, the discussion really revolved around, well, gee, we have all of our eggs in one basket, and if we would lose this lawsuit, we would lose the entire organization. So legal counsel said it would be very prudent on your part to separate these particular entities. So if certification process was at fault, it falls within the certification agency not within the NATA main body. So in uh, 1981, this is when Gary was, uh, was appointed as the, it was, this, it was at the conclusion of the June meeting that Gary came in as chair uh, of the Professional Education Committee and I had a big sigh of relief <coughs> at, at that point in time. Uh, trying to hold that down, and I was uh, was dumb enough at that time to have wandered into being the undergraduate program director, the graduate program director, and head athletic trainer at Indiana University. So I had enough on my plate just doing that without trying to do the, the chair's work as well. Thank you.
First of all, I'd like to say that I really think that what's been talked about so far, I would consider the first stage and the first phase of this road to becoming a profession. If they hadn't done what they've already talked about, we couldn't have continued. Oh, this is going to have to happen. Okay. Pardon me? Okay, I'll try to get back. <laughs> There's a whole story about this is Mike Bell. Is that Mike? <laughs> I'm so tempted to tell the story right now, but that'll take too much time later if you want to know. Mike probably knows what I'm talking about. Anyway, uh, now, where was I? <laughs> this is exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, throw me off with, with, with questions. Anyway. What was I talking about? <laughs> um, well, um, what I would like to do now is talk about what are some characteristics of a profession that I learned a few years ago. So if we talk about professionalization of athletic training, we need to understand what a profession is. So about a few years ago, I'm not several years ago, I guess it was 1983, I was asked to give the keynote speech at the National Convention in Denver. And the topic was, is athletic training a profession? I had no idea, except as uh, this, uh, this indicates, professionalization is a process. Realize from this start that that sequence, a lot of it has already happened. We became a full-time occupation. If you think back, how did some of our predecessors get into uh, athlete training? They started maybe as uh, interest. Some of them were part-time coaches. Even when I began, we had some coaches that had dabbled in athlete training. My former uh, trainer preceded me, not immediately, but at Arizona was a swimming coach, okay? And he became the athlete trainer. So it evolved into full-time uh, training programs. Notice in 1969, we began to formalize them. Uh, professional organization, 1950, okay? That's the characteristics of a developing profession. Uh, now, I want to interject something. One of my first convention was in 1956 in, on the grounds of Kramer Chemical Company in Gardner, Kansas. And the people I met there, a lot of them were founders I was involved six years after the NETA was founded. And I realized just a few years ago and now, my professional career almost paralleled, except for six years, even that, the growth uh, and evolution of athlete training as a profession. And not too many people have an opportunity for their professional career to begin and parallel the growth of their, their profession. So I've always appreciated that. So I got to meet the founders that sold me with the type of the character that they had. I want to be part of that. They were just great people, okay? I told the, uh, the uh, students the other day, or uh, yesterday morning at breakfast, I said, I, I, I know you. You've come this far as students. You don't know me. I've never met you, but I know who you are. Because if they came this far, they have the character that those of our founders did. And they're just great, great people. So I, and I, I truly believe that. Notice, gaining laser will uh, sanction. We've done that, okay? All righty, okay. Establishment of the Code of Ethics. That's, we won't say anything more about that. But it, a profession, a characteristic, uh, expected to place themselves, okay? So we have a Code of Ethics. That's already been done, okay? Now, uh, here's what I want to dwell on, uh, a profession. When I did this study, I, I uh, had a colleague at the University of Arizona, uh, Dr. Donna May Miller. She was into history, philosophy, all these fuzzy-wuzzy kind of topics. And she had a lot of literature. Uh, 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 and a lot of the literature she loaned me, uh, articles were written by, what's this, fly? Okay. By sociologists. And so I read them. And they had studied the characteristics of a profession, what they were and how. Developed. So, uh, 
we'll see in a few minutes. So you think of things like uh, law, you think of things like medicine, you think of things like theology. So when I was asked to speak, I said, well, how did these occupations become recognized as professions? So what I found in reading uh, this literature, that most of the authors, almost all of them, characterized four major characteristics of a profession. Specialized body of knowledge, a common body of knowledge, and unique and specialized. I'll get back to that in a few minutes. Professional authority, which I'll define, and community recognition and sanction. That's a sequence that one leads to the next, okay? So let me let me elaborate that in, in a few minutes. So when we say a common body of knowledge, that really meant, as a simple example, an athlete trainer in New York uh, has the same basic body of knowledge that an athlete trainer in Texas, in California, in North Dakota has, in Arizona. Now, what is that body of knowledge? I'll get back to that in a few minutes. We've done something that has uh, that has identified that body of knowledge. Just as a little preview, those two events in my mind was were the role of the nation studies done by the uh, uh, certification committee and the development of the competencies in athlete training, which was developed by the BEC, Professional Education Committee, and I'll get back to that. Uh, now, so those are the two things that contribute to that characteristic of a profession that was really kind of came into effect when I assumed the, the chairmanship, and we worked hard on those. Uh, so how do we develop this common body of knowledge? Uh, it is the competencies that had not been done. John talked about, we were kind of searching for identification as far as curriculum is concerned, and we utilize existing courses in physical education and recreation. The forerunner of the competencies were really the behavioral objectives that John referred to. But the behavioral objectives referred to objectives with regard to each of the courses that we use from physical education. And if you look at the history, those competencies, or the, the, those curriculum models, if you will, were revised four or five times. And so the behavioral objectives was an attempt to pick out of existing courses what we felt, as John alluded to, what could be most conducive to development as an athlete trainer and the body of knowledge they needed. But it wasn't quite where we needed to be, so we'll, we'll pick up on that. The, uh, so some of the, uh, John also mentioned the NAT, um, the discontinued routes. We had special consideration, that was me for one, okay, uh, because I was special. <laughs> didn't have any credentials, so that's the grandfather. Notice Pinky's influence. This, this was kind of into Pinky. We put in there uh, prerequisites in the early curriculum to go to PT school. Pinky wasn't pushing physical therapy. At that time, we didn't have course offerings. He felt that an athlete trainer, okay, a grandfather, could best make themselves better by going to PT school. So it was utilizing somebody else's curriculum to make athlete trainers better. He didn't He didn't say everybody had to be in a PT. That's not what he was saying. Uh, and then the internship. So you realize now that we begin to develop the, the, the things that would give us a common body of knowledge uh, is eliminating some of those requirements. Not because they weren't good ways to do it at the time, but because we didn't have anything in place that was better, let's see, kind of. Uh, so what happened is, as those uh, early models that were embedded within physical education began to change, uh, and also, as you know, the you know, one very controversial change was the internship being eliminated as a, as a certification. That was really controversial. And some of you may remember the, the reason for the, the controversy was we thought that, that uh, head athletic trainers would lose their source of student help. 
that was not true. You all still have student help, right? They just aren't necessarily considered athlete training students preparing for a certification exam. And so that that was not a necess that was not a good academic reason to keep the internship. The reason inadvertent not inadvertently, but probably contributed to this common body of knowledge is if you think about it, and I realize this even more so as a director of a graduate program, we'd have students that came from curriculums and we had students that came from internship programs. They were different in their knowledges. You see what I mean? Because some didn't have the, uh, the academic coursework that they do now. Others were great. And I have to tell you, again, it's Pinky's influence. I had students, so if you have Pinky, he was an excellent educator. So even, and that was an internship program at that time. Students from people like that, not just Purdue, but others, they were also, they were good, but it, they just weren't, had the same back of knowledge. So anyway, by elimination of one of the routes, we got it down to the curriculum route, okay? And that allowed for more of a common body of knowledge to be taught. For example, the competencies, which we'll talk more about in a few minutes, became the requirement to be accredited or approved by the, by the NATA as a curriculum. In other words, the curriculum had to demonstrate uh, some place in their curriculum that opportunities existed for the student to develop the competencies that we identified. See what I mean? And so we refer to that as opposed to the, the coursework requirement to education, the competency-based approach, subject matter approach to athlete training. So, Make sense, okay. Uh, so, if you look at what John was alluding to, uh, the first curriculum, some of those specific course requirements weren't required anymore. John alluded to one. We realized that we need to be in the business of educating athletic trainers, not future secondary school teachers, because they're not only going to go there. We didn't need to necessarily put in the prerequisites to go to PT school, unless they were also courses that contributed to becoming a better athletic trainer. Uh, physics, chemistry, all of that, okay? Plus they were hard and, what is this fly? <laughs> huh? We got some perfume on or something here? <laughs> anyway, if you look at these uh, first and second uh, curriculums, you'll see changes and narrowed down to what's most relevant to athletic training. This is leading up to, uh, I think John mentioned the athletic training major, okay? Uh, and one thing that I'd like to have you keep in mind, and I didn't remember this either, that there were three curriculums that had already developed athletic training majors. That means that they, they, they took those courses, 66 units at Central Michigan, took it to their board of uh, supervisor, board of director, board of uh, education in the state, and got it approved, 66 units in athlete training major. That was amazing at that time, to be able to accomplish that. And there were two others, is that correct, John? Okay. Well, we're gonna talk in a few minutes then. That was unusual at that time, and probably still is, because it's very difficult to get a major, especially of that size, through a, a board of regents as approved uh, athlete formal major, meaning it appears on their transcript and they can say they were an athlete. That was unusual even when I took over. So we're gonna talk about them, athlete training major or equivalent in just a few minutes, okay? To try to, try to not circumvent that, that issue, but to deal with the issue and the difficulty of getting it in other, other schools. So uh, take a look at those uh, curriculums as they developed here. Uh, the third one was the athletic training major or equivalent. So let me talk about that. Uh, we realized that we needed more room in a, a school's curriculum to teach the athletic training student what we thought they needed to know, okay? And so the, the emphasis changed. So we went to the concept of subject matter areas, as you can see, which it, it's not coursework. In some cases, they would be coursework, but if you go to 
with subject matter. That means that they can take these subject matter areas that need to be taught and put them in any course that the, 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 uh, the school chose to. Maybe, uh, I can't think of a good example, anatomy, a subject matter area. That would be a full course and not that much different from a typical uh, anatomy course. Very conducive to the needs of the athletic trainer. Other courses might be divided into units, maybe a short-term course in the summer. Uh, maybe some examples here, uh, whatever, nutrition, psychology. That might be taught with a, a short-term course in the summer, as long as it was covered adequately, then that would count. But it doesn't have to be structured like the typical one. Does that make sense? If anybody has any questions, just interrupt and let me know at this point about what I'm talking about. Um, and it says additionally, uh, additional competency-based coursework. Whatever they decide that's acceptable to the NATA for credit or approval purposes would be fine. They can design their own uh, curriculum. And then clinical experience requirements. So things begin to change with the thing. Now, what does the, um, the, the term athlete training major or equivalent mean? This was a hard concept to get approved by our NATA board of directors. And they said, equivalent, isn't that watering it down? It really wasn't. What that meant was if athlete training was housed in a department of physical education, for example, and that department required, let's say for a second discussion, 30 units to be considered a physical education major, then the package they put together also needed to be 30 units. You see? If it were 35 units, that's what the major in athletic training had to be. And they just presented that to us. So it's as strong as any major, but they didn't have to go to their board of directors to get it approved. So it was really the same thing, okay? But we, I don't want to use the term circumvented, but bypassed or hopefully alleviated the difficulty in a particular institution getting a stronger program. Okay. The other key thing, and we haven't talked about this, but also that major, they needed to, as it was before, uh, no, I'm sorry, after we developed the competencies, the school also had to uh, prove to us that that major gave ample opportunity for the competencies to be addressed. Okay? And those competencies, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, became a checklist. And they had to show us on paper, and we verify it as we go into on-site visitations. So those are the two primary characteristics of the athlete trainer, a major or equivalent. And it was the equivalent. What we found afterwards, somebody can verify this, that the schools realized that once they went through the process of developing this equivalency, they were ready to take it to their board of regents and get it approved as a major, uh, officially, meaning that they could put it on their transcript. Uh, how many of your schools, uh, you remember, did that? Anybody have a formal? Okay. Uh, did it start out as equivalency? And you realize that you did the homework. It's all there. Well, the board of directors, when we tried to get this, they didn't quite understand that. Maybe it was because of the terminology we use or the equivalent. So if you use that, you say, well, it's not the same then. Yeah, it is. Okay. So I think that worked for us. Uh, I don't know how many of them went on to get a, a board of region approval for a formal equivalent, but it really didn't matter in terms of the approval process. It was still as strong. It was still the same thing. I think we encourage them to get a formal major. I think a lot of them did more than we realized, but I really couldn't say how many. So uh, maybe not too many because nobody raised their hand. They said uh, yeah, one or two. Okay. Um, let's see. And then, then there were subject matter areas that must be taught. I think I mentioned rather than specific courses. That I think allowed more flexibility. Okay. So. This is another step, I think, that allowed us to develop this common body of knowledge that we're talking about. Now, what's that common body of knowledge, the competencies? Originally, 
it, so the two things that helped us, I think, in that what happened during my tenure as chair was were two things: the role in the Asian study, okay, and the development of competencies. They go hand in hand. Uh, the, the the keynote speech I gave there's an article I'd love to have you read. I hope you do on just that. That was the topic, and it talks about the need for a profession to define who they are. And we were searching for that, as John probably alluded to, during his stage. Early attempts were the, the behavioral objective. But we hadn't put that into one package. And this was kind of coincidental that Paul Grace was involved in the certification committee and did the role in the Asian study. The intent of that, in its simplistic terms, was, as I understand it, to validate the certification exam. In other words, does the exam cover what athlete trainers do. Well, we finally could show that by this firm that did the role in Asian studies. So they found out what athlete trainers do in the traditional setting. Remember somebody mentioned it was primarily high school, college, and pro athletics. Now it's different. We have athlete trainers working in other areas. So that finding out what it is might be a problem, okay? It could be. It is a problem. It, well, it's a challenge, okay? So the results of the role in the nation study now might be told to write the professional education committee the role in the nation, or I'm sorry, the competencies. And they were coordinated, which is another point. Don't ever lose sight of the fact that certification and accreditation and education are intricately tied together, okay, to be logical. So I can remember helping writing the first draft of the competencies and I'd get on the phone and talk to Paul Grace who simultaneously were doing the first role in nation study and I'd ask Paul I said and I'd send him drafts of our first role in uh, uh, competency and I'd say Paul is there anything in our first draft here that you are going to ask on the test or anything that's not on there and he'd say no you, you have as much in the competencies as we're going to ask on the certification exam because if that weren't true, it's like you have a teacher and gives you a final exam and it's nothing over what he taught. You see what I'm saying? So they needed to be coordinated. And I, I hope since that time, any revisions in the competencies, they have worked together with the results of subsequent uh, uh, role in nation studies. And it's understanding they have. If they get out of sync, that doesn't make any sense and it's misleading to, to the students. Um, that's a very important concept, and I really haven't followed up to. I have the, the, the fifth draft, or the fifth, fifth revision of the competencies, and they've been changed. Okay, I don't know if those questions are asking, are examined on the role or on the certification exam or not. I'm sort of lost track in that regard. There's one of the threats that I'm kind of talking about. If that 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 coordination gets out of sync, okay. Okay, now. Specialized, unique, common body of knowledge. Let me tell you how that paid off. Unique. That means not only do athlete trainers across the country have the same body of knowledge, which is embedded or is illustrated by the role or by the competency in athlete training. Okay, must be taught based on what you do, and everybody in every state has the same knowledge. It's also a unique body of knowledge. This is where, uh, recognized by the AMA years later that Bob uh, um, uh, worked on, that paid off. We had to demonstrate to the AMA that our body of knowledge and what we do was different enough from any other, from the lay public, and from any other allied health profession. If we could not do that, I don't think we would have been recognized by the AMA. Bob, would you agree with that? Yeah. That was a real challenge. We had to show that. I can remember I was at the AMA where they asked us those kinds of questions, and, and, and we were able to do that. The only thing I remember is there was an APTA uh, representative there that just wanted to call to attention that there was an overlap, which was in rehabilitation. That perfectly understandable. But in rehabilitation. But it's still, we were unique enough, rehabilitation
aggravation of sports-related injuries, that it was different from PT enough to be recognized as a separate allied health profession. You see what I mean? So these steps towards professionalization paid off that I don't think we even foresaw at the time by the recognition that we had, okay? Now, let's go to the second one. Once we have our, our common body of knowledge, our unique body of knowledge, by the role of the study and the competencies, have we defined athletic training? We really have, right? For the first time, we were able to, to give those two results of those documents and show the public or anyone who asks, anyone who challenges AMA the first time, that we are unique. We have our body of knowledge and it's unique. That makes sense, okay. What does that do? It leads to the second characteristic of a profession, professional authority. What does that mean? That means that if we are unique in that body of knowledge and it's common, then the public begins to look at us as the authorities in the field. Not that we have power, what you do, but it means, now think of examples now currently where athletic trainers are reviewed, are perceived as being the authority in healthcare for athletes. Pardon me? Exactly. Yeah, we should be honored by that. Athletic trainers doing a lot of research and, uh, and, and consider they're called upon. They recognize your authority, your training, and that ties in with the third characteristic here. Uh, I was talking, where's Kip? Kip, we were talking, uh, athletic trainers are um, uh, now being employed as spotters, is that what you call them? Kip, tell us just a little bit. What, what do you do for the NFL. Ten minutes. I have ten minutes left, or I've taken ten minutes. Oh, uh, need to clarify. Okay, I, I will be. Okay. Oh, Kip, where are you going? I only got ten minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were talking about the specialization again yeah. of our profession as an authority as medical profession doing medical spotting for collegiate games and for professional games, which I do both. And what's come of that is recognizing us as professions, professionals to recognize those types of injuries. Mm -hmm. It's that example, the third community recognition, they recognize the, the abilities of an athletic trainer to assume a role like that. We can think of all kinds of other examples of the authority some physicians or anyone just come and say, well, what do you think about this? That we didn't have that authority before we had this identity, okay? So it's paid off in some uh, subtle ways. So any, any questions about what the professional authority recognize that how, what a responsibility that gives you. It also implies is you really should know what you're talking about if we want people to continue to come. That means that we better not get into the medical area. They're not gonna ask us questions about surgery. They're gonna know right away that that's beyond our parameters. We're not the experts. That's not where we have the authority. Keep in mind that these allied, other allied health professions and medicine, they have their own parameters of expertise and authority. We are not surgeons. I'm not sure that we do diagnosis in terms of a medical diagnosis from a legal standpoint or the ability to make it. Do we assess? Certainly we do. Do we recognize injuries? Yes, and using the same techniques. But we don't come out and say this, this is an ACL. We have a high suspicion that it is. That's within the domain of medicine. Now, let me point out at this point, even if it isn't, that physician will, we would be perceived as in, in, in getting into their area of authority, professional authority, if we use that term. Because that physician say, this happened to me one time, 
you send it to me, but don't tell me what it is. I'll make the diagnosis, okay? So it's how what we do and say, how it's perceived by others, not our intent. I'm using a term. So be careful in what you say and what you do. Community recognition. There's just some examples here. And, and you can you can read the uh, uh, some examples here. Early, early things that some group outside us, other communities, recognized our authority and gave us that recognition. Okay. Probably the ultimate is is uh, licensure. We talked about the importance there, and I was really I never thought about this, but the model legislative model uh, certification exam that created the standard. What what uh, what they did in that area. Lindsay and that group did. The model legislation was stringent enough that it became the model for state certificate or licensure exams. I remember that at the time, but it just reminded me that, that was a good thing. Okay, uh, I uh, yeah, I, I remember. Maybe I said this earlier. I forget what I said even ten minutes ago. That I had several students say that this their licensing exam was not as tough as our certification exam, and I said what? You would not expect that necessarily to be true, but in some cases it, it was. Okay, criteria for recognition for allied health profession. This was Bob's area, but keep in mind, I had another list of those criteria, Bob. I don't know if you had it or not. Maybe you're going to talk about it, so I'll let it go, okay? But it was very stringent, okay? I wanted to just say one thing in closing. Two minutes. Five minutes? Oh, wow. I can be extraneous. Back one page. Okay. I get out of sync too. Okay, I'm okay. I, I have to say so I, I gave a talk to this group several years ago. That's when I was right after I left AT Cell and I asked John Parsons, who was one of my faculty members or one of the former students, I said, What do you think I ought to talk about? And I'm thinking, well, I'll talk about something I did done every day, classwork, coursework. Huh? Louder, okay. I, I thought, well, all I was on my mind was I got to talk about some subject matter, which is the same thing I taught in class, which he'd heard many times, and I was sick about talking. He said, subtly in some way, well, just talk about you and your experiences. And that kind of threw me. And I said, well, that's a relief because I got tired of talking about hearing my lectures anyway. Well, what he was really saying is, I don't want to hear you talk about subject matter anymore. <laughs> that, that was his. <laughs> that was his diplomatic way of saying, "Don't, I don't want to hear that anymore." So, okay. Anyway, that's what I'm feeling now. So I got two minutes to be extraneous. Eh? Okay, um, I just want to say that uh, this changed, it crystallized my thinking about what we should be doing. So everything you hear today, hopefully are the story of athletic training evolution, or education evolution. And if it doesn't, I think everything you're going to hear, I think will allow you to realize its contribution to the professionalization. When this first started, I'd say we weren't a profession yet. Now, as perceived by this criteria, I can say now, and if you think about it, you, we are involved, we are a profession by this criteria. And that's something that you should be proud of. You are professionals working in a profession. Okay. And probably that's a good time to, to stop. First of all, I, I want to make a, a quick thank you to the Rocky Mountain Athletic Trainer Association for having this group here. And uh, our leading force, <laughs> the leading force who glued this whole thing together, if you can believe it or not, Mike Nesbitt. <laughs> now, I'm not normally a preacher, but what I want to do a little bit at the beginning and a little bit at the end is preach a little bit. And, 
and that's, first of all, I want to talk to the students here. Uh, a long time ago, I was an undergraduate student athletic trainer. We got 65 cents an hour. If you really had a good year, you got a dime raise the, the next year. Uh, one year, District 4 ran a contest for its members. Those who signed up the most student trainers as members of the NATA got a free trip to the convention. So myself and all of my fellow student trainers joined the NATA, although our head trainer didn't win the contest, but uh, that's how we got started. I became a secondary school athletic trainer. Let me take that aside for a minute and say this. I think that the experiences I personally had at the high school level were the best. You know why? Because everything I did was appreciated. The parents appreciated it. The kids that never had an athletic trainer, they appreciated it. You move on to the college level and the professional level, and it's expected. You also have to be, I don't want to offend anybody here, but you have to be the best prepared and most knowledgeable athletic trainer at the high school level because you're it. That college athletic trainer, that professional athletic trainer, and even the clinicians have the physicians on hand. Uh, in my state, there's a certain basketball program that when someone's hurt, it seems like a convention of physicians out on the floor. All the athletic trainer has to do is fold the towels after the timeout's over. I better be careful what I say. <laughs> Anyhow, I became what was called, once I worked at the high school level, I became an active athletic trainer. That was a term we were active long before certified. And I went to my first convention, it happened to be in Chicago. And this is the point I want to make. I sat down in the back row. The whole convention was in a room about this size. And, and two gentlemen sat down next to me on either side. I didn't know them, they didn't know me. And, you know, it was just a second year high school athletic trainer. One of them, well, first of all, both of them are Hall of Famers. They're both deceased now. One's uh, Lloyd Snapperstein at University of Minnesota. And a person a lot of people have a hard time remember because he was old when then that convention. His name was Dutch Letzinger. He was the athletic trainer at Louisiana State University. They wanted to know why I was there, who I was and what I was doing. And then they told me who they were. Later on in the day, they introduced me to some other people. And that grew. And when we were talking about networking, what I want to say to the students is, you, you've got You've got Hall of Fame out here right in front of you. Walk up to them. Go ahead and interrupt them when they're having a conversation with each other. Don't let that bother you. They'd be glad to know who you are and what you're doing. And someday, somebody's going to say, hey, we need extra help at the uh, registration desk. Go ahead and volunteer. The more you volunteer, the more your name gets out there. The more people you talk to, Mike can remember all your names if you just tell them what they are. Okay? There's, a, there's a lot of you out there like that. And I, I really, uh, I, I think that, that that was the early form of networking, that one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, you'll, it, it will lead to things you just can't imagine. It'll lead to, well, in, in my situation, I went to a convention, and I sat there, and we talked about the fact that uh, we, we became uh, kind of students at the convention. So I can remember a convention in St. Louis, I'm walking down the hall, and all of a sudden, out of one of the side rooms, Spike Dixon grabs me, and he says, here, I need your ankle. And he's putting on a performance. 
for a group of students that had just wandered in, so to speak, in one of the unused rooms at, at that time. That all grows. It just, it's, well, as I said, I think that's where you're most appreciated, and that's where you need the best education, because you're out there by yourself. That first job, you can't be everywhere. When I was with football or basketball, the wrestling coach was unhappy because I didn't go to his meets. I mean, you've got that all the way through. Same thing with the track, baseball. You can't be everywhere. And now, uh, I think the answer for all of us, really, is not to pay you more money. It's to get you more help. And that's where we need to work at. We need to work at more jobs. I am happy to see through some of the stuff that uh, I read and what I know about education as a result of the day I left was what you read. I read in the, uh, uh, on, the com on a computer every, what is it, Monday or Tuesday, we get a list of things. I love that little part at the bottom where we can see all the awards that everybody gets. Uh, I also, uh, the monthly uh, NATA news, I learn about education there. And now the latest, are you all reading the dead? Okay. Yeah, I read that and see it, a little bit more about what people are getting in the way of help and ways to go about getting more help. And I think that's fantastic when I see high schools uh, that, are, that have got two and three certified athletic trainers makes me want to start all over again at the high school level because uh, that's, that's really great. Well, following a little bit along with me when uh, everybody talks about being grandfathered in, I was grandfathered in as well and uh, helped out on one of the first uh, oral practical exams. I want to say it was in Kansas City, so what was that, uh, 71 or 72, Lindsay, if you remember, 74. That was quite an experience because then my next uh, uh, situation was to move to a university where at one time we were competing in a football game uh, at the University of Washington. And I'd known uh, Bud Miller from his days at uh, Ball State. And so we were talking and he handed me a manual that was about his thoughts about the starting of a curriculum, and I believe the co-authors were John Schrader and Mark's mom. Still got that. It's awful yellow in color, but yeah, I mean, because it's about uh, 48 years old, right? Well, I wanted to make a brief comment about licensure. Our friends in Texas started the first movement. And they had it in the NATA journal. And I liked it. I, I thought that looked pretty good. So I called a meeting of all the athletic trainers that were certified or actively engaged in Illinois. And two of them showed up. Al Kranz in Northern Illinois and uh, Bill Collins at Illinois State. And we played golf and at lunch, and I talked about this. And then I got called before the board of directors in 1975. We were in Anaheim. My family was at Disney World or Disneyland while I was before the board. And uh, what that led to, that conversation, I had written along with a lawyer slash legislator that was a friend of our program at Illinois, uh, what was called the Model Act. And that was published in the NATA Journal. Model Act. A lot of states took it and tore it down and put it back together again, according to their legislators, and used it as their uh, initial attempt at legislation. Times moved slowly, and it took only about 20 years in Illinois and about 20 years in Indiana to get it through the legislation, but we both have that coverage now. 
And I think that was a step towards being a professional. I uh, was the first chair of the licensure committee then, and, and we had a, a great meeting in Colorado. And Otho said, you're going to be the chair, and I'm going to send people to you. Well, as you can imagine, that first licensure committee was loaded with NFL athletic trainers. And it was one in particular that I fell in love with, and you all know him. His name is Steve Antonopoulos. And I know that he played a role in your recent work in Colorado. So here he is, 1975, and 19, I mean, 2019, he's still working at it. Love him for it. I uh, got invited to the Quail Roost Conference that John had spoken about earlier. And I have some fond memories of that as well. Not exactly education, but uh, we were kept up all night. They had us in dorm rooms. I think four of us were sleeping in the same dorm room at this resort. And uh, we thought somebody was being seriously abused out of the Grounds. And next morning, guess what they told us? It was it was the uh, mating season for the uh, peacocks. <laughs> Have you ever heard them scream? <laughs> Kept us up at night, didn't it, John? <laughs> so that's one of my memories from the, the quail roots. The other was this: our first session started at eight. And by, the, by 9 o'clock, I had uh, consumed an entire pitcher of water. And I found out, I guess I could give credit to uh, uh, Dr. Kaiser, but my water salt balance was in balance because of the fact that I had first tasted at that breakfast something that they called ham out there in Virginia and North Carolina that had quite a amount of salt in it. So we had a, a little experiment right there that uh, uh, kind of led the way to our discussions uh, about water and salt, and et cetera. So what happened was uh, John Schrader got appointed to, to substitute for uh, Bud's work. And part of that, part of that was they looked into some outside accrediting bodies for our education programs. One was COPA or the uh, Council on Post-Secondary Accreditation. Another one was called the NCHCA, which was National Commission for Health Certifying Agencies. That seemed to be more appropriate for our certification program, of which was eventually uh, they did certify our uh, a program. The outside force was what was important. And what happened was John took it to the board, and like a lot of things, things moved slowly. At that time, the board was of a different makeup. You had some people that were grandfathered in. You had some people who were certified in, and they moved rather slowly. And in fact, change was very difficult for particularly the older group, those that were uh, grandfathered in. And so it was set aside. And following that, I moved to another institution where I was at one time, both the graduate director and the undergraduate program director. And uh, what had happened in uh, those years is we hosted the exam, the certification exam. And uh, as a program director, 
I supervised or proctored, if you want to say that, the uh, written part of the exam. And then we had our athletic trainers, as well as some outsiders, come in and serve on the teams that did the oral practical. We used our athletes, and we used our student athletic trainers. Well, Lindsay, after a few years, put a stop to that. Because our students do what was on the oral practical. And we just used our athletes. Well, our athletes told our students what was on the oral practical. And so the rules changed, and, uh, and we could not host anymore. But I do have to go back to a William Newell story. He would drive down from West Lafayette to be part of uh, be an oral practical examiner. Because he loved it. He really enjoyed it. And two times he was late. But when he got there, we put him to work. And then had a little social at, at the house afterwards. And years later, unfortunately, after uh, he died, uh, Denny Miller came to me and he said, Do you remember when Pinky was late to those two? oral practical exams that you used him in. I said, yeah, what happened? Got arrested for speeding. He was in a hurry to get down to Terre Haute to help us on those oral practicals. That's another person. You just, if you knew him, you loved him. programs were being evaluated. And one of the on-site visitors was a good friend named Jack Redman. And Jack was on the committee, and he said, uh, we went out to dinner, and, I, and he said, what are you doing now? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you don't have an athletic assignment. You're a full-time academic. You've got somebody else as graduate program director, somebody else as undergraduate program director, what do you do? And I said, well, I teach an undergraduate class. I teach a graduate class, both of them in athletic training. And then I go out a few days a week and, and observe the students that we have out in the local high schools. He said, what do you do on the other days? I said, I go home like the rest of the faculty about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And he, he said, that's not right. That's not right. He said, if you've got all that time, how would you like to be the chair of the professional education committee? And I said, you're kidding. He said, no, really. The program experiences you've had and, and uh, et cetera. He said, how, I'd like to recommend you. I said, well, go ahead, okay. Following year, it's now 1987, and I get a call from the executive director, and he said, we want you to meet with the board in June. And I became the, uh, I replaced Gary. And that summer, uh, the executive director said, go down to Arizona, meet with Gary. I went down there, and uh, it was August. I know it was July. The reason I know it was July is because we went from Gary's office to the student union. And I think the soles of my shoes burned off. Because... <laughs> My feet were really hot. So we cooled off, and, and I said, uh, well, Gary, why don't you just uh, give me the stuff, and I'll take it back. And he said, I'll send it to you. And he did. And there were boxes, and the next day more boxes, and more boxes. And we filled two empty faculty offices with boxes from the Professional Education Committee. Well, the first two years, I had a committee of 13. And by the way, out of those 13 people, you saw a huge committee that I believe John uh, presented to you. 
We had 13 people, and they all had different assignments, undergraduate, graduate, continuing education, etc. Out of those 13 people, 11 of them are now in the Hall of Fame. So, you know, they had, they had a pretty good idea what they were supposed to do, and they did it so well that one of the saddest things that uh, I had as far as that job was when the executive director said, you know, we've got so many committees in this organization, and everybody has a representative. Each district had, you know, so these committees are huge. They're all 10, you got 13, and he said, cut it down. Well, that was tough. That was really tough because I had people that, uh, everybody had an assignment. So we were going to have to double up on assignments, and, and some people um, were, I guess the term would be cut from the committee. And uh, that was not appreciated by some. One of them still didn't talk to me, but that's okay. But uh, I spent the first two years with just part of the procedure. We, Gary had ended a cycle. When I mean a cycle, we're talking about a, a curriculum was accredited or approved, excuse me, the word approved, for five years. And then you had to do it all over again. And so he had gotten through all the programs, and now they were starting over again. And so I, I came in on a new cycle that uh, the first program that we approved, now five years later, was up again. So that, that was my job. I had, I had to learn how to uh, work that as far as the applications and all the uh, adjunct material they had sent, the visitation team reports, the uh, discussions, the uh, uh, potential for probation and how to get off of probation and on and on and on. So after two years, I finally took a breath and started into those boxes that Gary had sent. And lo and behold, I found Bud Miller's notes on accreditation by an outside source, be it COPA or something else. And uh, COPA, it, uh, you had it had to be a major. We weren't quite there yet. So that was set aside. The National Commission for Health Certifying Agencies, it was felt was more appropriate for our certification uh, exam. Way down deep in the file was something called CAHIA, which was the AMA's committee on allied health I went to the executive director and I said, you know, this, this looks like a pretty good possibility that we could fit into this. And he said, go find out. So I went to the AMA up in Chicago, spent a couple of days, and uh, they gave me all the material that was supposed to be for the application. And I took that back and then the executive director took it to the board. And again, the board makeup was such that it's, it was a little hard to nudge some people along. There was another group that was really ready to go. Fortunately, the majority won. And we proceeded to make application to Kihia, uh, which was a committee of That committee was made up of 19 different allied health professionals. And we had to make an application, and I did. And I think, uh, Dave, you want to go to that next slide for me just real quick? The, the one with that one. That's it. 337 pages that included all the work these people had done for all these years. All the procedures and the policies and the, the studies, the self-studies, the, the everything, and including a group of letters from friendly physicians. In our association, that was easy to find. 
And so we used as much physician power as we could for that application. Well, the first thing is they assigned a gentleman from the AMA who worked in the Kihia office as our liaison. And he helped us through the whole procedure. Then we had to, uh, once we got NATA board approval to, to proceed, uh, we completed the application. And it was taken to a committee of, a committee within a committee of Kihia, which meant some of the representatives from those 19 professionals. When they saw what we had submitted, they said, we want you. So the next step was to convince Kahia as a whole. We went to a meeting in Chicago. I picked up John and, and Denny Miller on the way, and, and uh, Gary was there, and Quite a few of the physicians, <coughs> excuse me, that supported us were there. And the opposition was there, the APTA. <coughs> After that meeting, it was felt that uh, we were worthy of becoming a member of Kahia. So <coughs> the procedure was unbelievable. First thing we had to do was uh, form. Next one. We had to form what's called a joint review committee. Thanks. A review committee. There were 19 joint review committees already, see, because everybody else had their own committees of their professions. And so we formed ours. We had five athletic trainers, all came from. And one physician, and one uh, physician from the American Academy of Pediatricians, and another from the American Academy of Family Physicians. Those people were those that were directly involved with us as athletic trainers, the pediatricians and the family physicians. Later on, a few years later on, the uh, orthopedic surgeons joined us, uh, you know, so we had a representative from the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine that made up uh, our eight members of the committee. Shortly thereafter, as we uh, started business, and we were just conducting basically what the PEC did, same format, although they changed our <coughs> essentials and guidelines to standards and guidelines. That was about the only change they made in our whole procedure that, that everybody else had done the work for me. So it was kind of just me falling in on the tail end of that. And then you hear there's no longer any KEHIA. There's something called KHEP. KHEP's the Commission on Accreditation for Allied Health Education Programs. At that time, it had grown now into 26 allied health professions. Oh, we had the PAs and the EMTs and the, uh, the x-ray techs and uh, the uh, occupational therapists. And, you know, I mean, they have all 26 of them, but the, there was quite a group. And all the difference was that the AMA, which had a committee called Kahia, no longer had that committee disbanded it, and became a member of what was formerly Kahia, now called KHAP. So the, the, we were all together, and we got a new member called the AMA, and they sat in on all of our things. So uh, each organization uh, representative had a, had a representative to the overall body called KHEP. And Larry Lemons was the first one our board of directors selected. Ultimately, uh, Larry was such a good participant that they uh, elected him president for a couple of years as well. So uh, 
another feather in, in our cap. I might also mention that uh, what this did, and the only way we were going to become a uh, member was if we became an allied health profession. And they wanted to know how we fit in. Well, that 200, or 337 pages convinced them that we were uh, qualified to call ourselves an allied health profession. So the AMA said we're an allied health profession. To me, that, that took us out of the locker room and put us in the classroom. And I have to emphasize one point to you. The AMA recognized us as an allied health profession initially so that it could accredit our education programs through CAHIA. Once, and I don't know how this happened because it's beyond me, we left that umbrella. There was no longer the recognition. A lot of people still go up and say, well, we're an allied health profession. We're recognized by the MI. You were recognized by the but you no longer are because you're not under that umbrella. That's not to say that we're not an allied health profession. We made ourselves one. And we fit in just with all the rest of them. But as far as KIA or KF, we're out of that. Don't ask me how that happened because I wasn't here for that. But uh, uh, what had happened after we started this is our first programs were accredited, I think, in 1993. And then, as it grew and grew and grew, we, had, we asked permission and got it to interview two organizations that also ran joint review committees. What I'm saying is that I had a secretary, as the others did, although she was kind of special, because uh, uh, what had happened was to have her work for me in, a, in an office adjoining mine, uh, the university said she has to be employed by us, but your organization will pay her salary. She loved that because the people in Dallas said, here's what you would make if you were a secretary for the NATA in Dallas. And I had the pick of the crop. You couldn't imagine the people on campus that wanted to be secretary for that position because it, it didn't compare to our pay scale. It was a, a very nice position. But she took that over. And uh, as I was getting ready to retire, obviously she would be out of a job. But we needed somebody to do the, that work. Not the not, uh, work that the committee did, but the paperwork, the, the filing of this and the filing of that and the reports on this, and she uh, recorded every nickel we ever spent, and uh, you know, so I got stacks of book work. I, I told the uh, people yesterday that I have one box, it's about this big, of every meeting of the PEC that Bud Miller or John Schrader ran. So we had, t see, I still un I've still got stuff in my garage that I need to unpack, Gary. But we got the job done with what we could find. And then in 19, well, uh, I think it was 19, who was on our committee, was also on the Joint Review Committee. And what he did was he did a survey, did a survey of the Board of Directors, the Board of Certification, Program Directors, past and present members of the Professional Education Committee to see what we were going to do with the Professional Education Committee 
after we had removed the entry-level programs under the Joint Review Committee. It came up with 11 recommendations, and the board took two of them. And they created two uh, programs, two uh, groups. One was chaired by Richard Ray, and the other was chaired by Chad Starkey. And I have to tell you, to be honest with you, from that day on, I don't know what happened. And I think Gary and John will tell you the same thing. It's almost like when, you, when you're out, you're dead. Okay? And the next people take over. Well, I have a, a couple of interests. See, I told you I was going to preach a little bit here at the end. The uh, PEC after 28 years of incredible work, quietly went out of service in 1998. So did I. But I still read and, and watch and listen and wonder what's going on. And I have a question. I don't know. Yesterday, yesterday, Gary kept talking to me about Katie, 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 Katie. Well, I have a good friend who uh, was a colleague of mine who uh, also got her master's degree with some of you by the name of Katie Grove. And I'm thinking, what's Katie doing? She retired. In fact, <laughs> John and I and Katie had their last lunch before she left Bloomington to go back to Minnesota. And finally, finally, he said, C-A-A-T-E. I said, oh, what's that? He said, well, that's, that's the current accrediting body. And I said, who is it? <laughs> and he said, well, it's athletic trainers. And I said, who, who, uh, who puts those people on that? And he said, he didn't know. And I said, well, what do they do? He said, they accredit programs. And I said, you mean you have athletic trainers accrediting the programs? And I said, I thought that's what we did in the 70s and the 80s. It was called the PEC. It was athletic trainers uh, excuse me, approving educational programs. Well, that beside the point. I'm going to talk about one last slide and I 1998, I did something, I took on a new job that I should have been doing my entire career. You're, nothing more fun than being an athletic trainer. You know, the old saying, you hear a lot of people say, it was never work because I enjoyed every day I went. So did I. But it ended. And it will for all of you. Someday. And when it does, there's a group of people that you should have been paying attention to all along, and that's family. You see that all, how about the NCAA basketball tournament? Everybody had a t-shirt on that said family. They're talking about their basketball teams, of course. But what I'm talking about is mother, father, brother, sister, spouse, aunts, uncles, cousins, what have you. There's a, a real easy way to forget them because you're too busy taking care of other people's children and not your own family as far as right now. I'll take that last slide now. There's my job, okay? There's my job, all 23 of us. And since 1998, I haven't missed a wedding. I haven't missed a graduation graduation from college, high school, grandparents' day at elementary schools, volleyball games, basketball games, 
concerts, you name it. All kinds of things that I missed until 1998. So since 1998, that's my career. And I'm missing a tennis match today. <laughs> <laughs>